What's up, moviegoers? Welcome to the Markio Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony. In this episode, I'm talking about Hellraiser 7, Debtor, or Hellraiser Debtor. It's directed by Rick Boda, and the original script was written by Neil Marshall Stevens, who also wrote the script for the 2001 remake, 13 Ghosts. Now, however, like the previous two entries in the series, Hellraiser Inferno and Hellraiser Hellseeker, this script began as an unrelated spec script and was subsequently rewritten and to be made into a Hellraiser movie. Now, like Inferno, series creator Clive Barker did not have any involvement at all in this series or in this movie. Now, the movie tells a story about a journalist who uncovers an underground group who can bring back the dead and slowly becomes drawn into their world. Now, Doug Bradley does reprise his role as Pinhead, which is great to see, as always. And Kyrie Warrer plays journalist Amy Klein. Now, if you don't know who Kyrie Warrer is, she was a big name uh, B-movie actress in the 90s and starred as the gypsy woman in Stephen King's Thinner movie. Now, as I said, the movie tells a story about a journalist and Amy, the journalist, is sent to uh, Bucharest at the behest of her boss, Charles, to investigate a videotape depicting a ritualistic murder and a subsequent reanimation of a cult which calls themselves the Debtors. Now, Amy tracks down a return address of the tape and discovers the corpse of its sender, Marla, who holds the Lamont configuration. So, Amy takes the Lamont configuration back to the hotel, of course, and what does she do? She opens the box and summons Pinhead. Now, as the movie goes on, Amy pursues uh, certain leads in the case and figures out that she tracks down the leader of the cult, Winter Lemonchard. Now, if that name sounds familiar, Lemonchard is the name of the descendants in Hellraiser 4 Bloodline who created the Lamont configuration puzzle box, which summons Pinhead and the Cenobites. Now, basically, uh, Winter Lemonchard says that he's the descendant of the toy maker who, like I said, designed the puzzle box. So he believes he is destined to access this realm of the Cenobites and become their master. But he's unable to open the box himself. So basically, uh, Winter basically turns Amy, the journalist, into like a subject of a ritualistic murder. And um, as she does this, she, she has a so-called waking dream, which reveals that her father physically and sexually abused her, did things to her when she was a young child. Now, while doing so, Amy successfully opens the puzzle box and summons the Cenobites and Pinhead. Now, the interesting fun factor about this is that once Pinhead is summoned, he expresses his disdain for Winter Lemon Shard and his family and his descendants because basically he says that he's denying that any mortal could ever control the Cenobites. So a lot of stuff happens in the last uh, half hour to 45 minutes of this movie. I don't want to give anything away. I already gave uh, some of the plot points in the movie. Just to, you know, just to see if uh, if you'd be interested in checking it out. Uh, like I said, it's great to see Doug Bradley back as Pinhead. He never misses a beat. And as usual, Pinhead uh, shows up at the end of every single Hellraiser movie. Now, um, where do I stand with this seventh entry in the Hellraiser franchise? Let me tell you, uh, I'm not a fan of this movie at all. Uh, even though they put in the descendant of the Lamont configuration, Winter Lemon Shard, um, it was already done in Hellraiser 4 Bloodline. We don't need it again. We don't need it after this. And, you know, just connecting the descendants of who created the Lamont configuration and why you need to open it. And basically because you think you're destined to, you know, to control the Cenobites. Like Pinhead said, uh, no mortal can control the Cenobites. They're their own being. I mean, so this movie has different points of, you know, being boring at times. And yes, it was boring. Um, I couldn't get into it. And uh, this movie, is, like I said, wasn't that good. It's only 89 minutes long. And once again, it was straight to video. And it was released in June of 2005. It's not the best reviewed Hellraiser movie. Uh, a lot of people don't like it. And I really, really do commend Doug Bradley for returning in a seventh movie. Especially playing the most recognizable horror iconic villain of all time. And the leader of the Cenobites, Pinhead. I mean, listen, he's very devoted to what he does. He's a fantastic actor, a very underrated actor. 
and seeing him play the same character in seven movies, even as the movies somewhat get worse, even though after the third one, um, they get slowly, slightly, they get slightly better, but it, they really don't. And to me, uh, seven is where the movies should have stopped. But there's an eighth movie. Yes, they made an eighth Hellraiser movie, which I will be talking about in my next episode of the Markio podcast. Now, for production, um, the script was submitted to Dimension Films in 2000, and during the production of the script for 13 Ghosts, it was planned to be produced by Stan Winston. Yes, the late, great Stan Winston. As in the final film, it entitled a news reporter being sent to Romania covering an underground cult, which discovered the secret immortality and had gained contact with an otherworldly dimension, but it did not feature connections to the Hellraiser series. So what did they do? They threw in Pinhead, they threw in the Lamont configuration, they threw in Winter Lemon Shard as a descendant of the Lemon Shard family who created the Lamont configuration. The film was originally rewritten to take place in London and later the Lower East Side of Manhattan before the producers opted to film it simultaneously with another Hellraiser sequel, Hellraiser Hellworld. Basically they did this just to save the cost of money and to make things run more smoothly. Now the only problem is that with this production was difficult because it was due to the inability of the American cast and crew trying to understand the Romanian workers and actors that were part of the Hellraiser Debtor movie. So you see why Hellraiser Debtor is not that good of a Hellraiser movie. Even though you bring in the scriptwriter who wrote 13 Ghosts, you have this movie produced by Stan Winston, the great Stan Winston, and you have Rick Boda returning to direct doesn't mean that this is going to be a good Hellraiser movie. And it shows, and it wasn't. I wasn't a fan of the ending and how the main character, so-called, you know, um, I'm not going to give it away, but um, I didn't like how the main character left the movie. It was, felt like it was a silly writing error by the s- screenwriters that they didn't know what to do with the main character, and they just put it in there to end the movie, and that was it. So let me know in the comment section below what your thoughts on the seventh Hellraiser movie is Hellraiser Debtor. Did you like it? What did you think about it? And if you haven't seen it, will you be checking it out? And do you think it's the worst Hellraiser movie in the franchise? If so, why? And be sure you click that subscribe button and hit that notification bell for new videos and new podcast episodes on the Mark Your Productions YouTube page. And follow Mark Your Productions on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And follow me, Anthony, your host on Instagram and Twitter at Mr. Filmstock and follow the Markio podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'll leave a link to all the social media accounts in the description box below. You can check it out and follow along. All right, everyone, that does it for today's episode. I'm your host, Anthony. Thanks for tuning in. This world, it obviously disappoints you all. That is why you chose to begin this journey.